After years of ambiguity and months of renewed controversy and public backlash, the United States Supreme Court has officially adopted for the first time in its 200 plus year history, a binding code of ethics. But that's not quite the end of the story. But before we unpack all that, if you haven't yet, please hit that like, subscribe, and the alert bell. All right, folks, so this is actually a big deal. This is something that Senate Democrats have been pushing for for months, ever since ProPublica came out with one bombshell story after another that conservative Justice Clarence Thomas had been the recipient of these very lavish gifts. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of very often unreported gifts from yacht trips and fishing trips and vacations to the fact that a conservative billionaire donor named Harlan Crow was actually funding the education of a relative of Clarence Thomas. I mean, it just reeked of enormous corruption. And yet some progress has been made today, and I'll let Fox News break the news. Moments ago, the Supreme Court says it is adopting a code of ethics for the very first time. Our David Spunt live in Washington with the breaking news. David? Well, John, this is after repeated calls from Democrats and some Republicans for the nine justices on the Supreme Court to be held to some sort of code of conduct. The Supreme Court justices have always said that they have abided by common rule ethics practices. Now they have a formal photo of co uh, code of conduct. I have it in my hands. Uh, 14 pages, including the cover page. It has several different can. And this comes uh, after several justices, including Justice Clarence Thomas, Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor, have come under scrutiny uh, for some of the financial uh, dealings, even including Justice Samuel Alito. I want to read one quick part about compensation. It says a justice may accept reasonable compensation and reasonable uh, and reimbursement of expenses for permitted activities if the source of the payments does not give the appearance of influencing the justice's official duties or otherwise appear improper. John and Jillian, you may remember uh, Senator Dick Durbin uh, with the Judiciary Committee has been pushing for a specific code of conduct for justices, waiting to hear uh, exactly what he has to say. But this is the first time we've ever seen at the Supreme Court an official code of conduct signed by all nine of the Supreme Court justices. So yeah, folks, this is a huge deal. I mean, but it's not the end of the story, okay? And before we break it down, I want to let uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, one of my favorite senators, he's uh, the senator from Rhode Island, I want him to basically weigh in. He kind of encapsulates the nutshell of why this is still an incomplete step. Well, step one is done. The Supreme Court has at last acknowledged that it needs to have a code of ethics and has formally adopted one which it kind of had all along. So the real test now is how do you enforce it? Is there a place where you can file a complaint against a justice? Who sorts out the ridiculous complaints from the legitimate ones? For the legitimate ones, who does the fact finding about what happened? Once you know what the facts are, who compares what was done to what is allowed under this new code of ethics? And do we get a public report at the end that explains? Really, really basic, basic questions. They need to answer those, and until they do, that job is not done. It's not. Sheldon Whitehouse and Dick Durbin are two of the Democrats in particular that have been really pushing that the Supreme Court adopt a code of ethics or have one imposed on them by Congress, which itself has been the source of controversy. So I do want to play this is or show rather, this is the preamble to the um, code of conduct that uh, the Supreme Court issued earlier today. This, it says, the undersigned justices are promulgating this code of conduct to set out succinctly and gather in one place the ethics, rules, and principles that guide the conduct of the members of the court. Then they say, listen, for the most part, these rules and principles are not new. The court has long had the equivalent of common law ethics rules. That is, a body of rules derived from a variety of sources, including statutory provisions, the code that applies to other members of the federal judiciary, ethics advisory opinions issued by the Judicial Conference Committee on Codes of Conduct and Historic Practice. The absence of a code, however, has led in recent years to the misunderstanding that Supreme Court justices, unlike all other jurists in this country, regard themselves as unrestricted by any ethics rules. To dispel this misunderstanding, we're issuing this code, which largely represents a codification of the principles we've long regarded as governing our conduct. Now, again, I can't 
I'm not going to sit here and pretend that this isn't an historic moment because it certainly is, but this is long and painfully overdue. And it's very clear as to why this is the case, because ever since the, the news broke about Clarence Thomas's, you know, corrupt practices and, you know, indications that Samuel Alito, another conservative justice, uh, was also engaging in something similar with a different donor, a different backer, a guy named uh, Leonard Leo, who's a very prominent and nefarious conservative uh, activist. The Democrats were basically saying in the Senate, okay, this isn't cool. We can't have a situation in which one branch of government is effectively not beholden to ethics guidance. Because here's the thing. Members of Congress are bound by enforceable codes of conduct. Members of the executive branch are bound by enforceable codes of conduct. The Supreme Court is not supposed to be – there's no provision in the Constitution which even suggests, let alone says, that the Supreme Court gets to be above all that. I mean think about it. Conservatives put so much emphasis on the, the wisdom of our fallible founding fathers. Do you really think the founding fathers who just waged a war to emancipate ourselves from you know, the crown, the King George of the Third of England, actually wanted to create a, one branch of government of nine – unelected lifetime appointees, nine little kings, as it were, who were not beholden to ethics rules, really? If anything, the Supreme Court is the branch which most requires ethics guidelines because, again, they're not elected. So if you don't like their conduct, it's not like you can vote them out. And they're lifetime appointees, so it's not like they have term limits, right? They need the most ethics scrutiny, arguably, than anybody, including members of Congress and members of the executive branch. And yet they've resisted it every step of the way. Earlier this year, Senate Democrats invited uh, Chief Justice John Roberts to appear before the Senate and kind of testify as to what's going on uh, with you know financial disclosures and, and gift reporting and all these things. And... Roberts declined. He said, no, there's separation of powers. I'm not going to testify before Congress. Okay, So that's when Senate Democrats were like, well, you better get a code together because if you don't, we're going to enforce one on you, which is kind of a, a tall order given that it would need support most likely from uh, certainly the other chamber of Congress, which they currently don't control. Republicans control that, and Senate Democrats – excuse me, Senate Republicans are inclined to fight them every step of the way. As a matter of fact – this is Tom Cotton, a Republican senator, who said this just on November 2nd, just a few days ago, when Senate Democrats were preparing to issue a subpoena for Harlan Crow and Leonard Leo, two of the conservative activists slash donors who they believe may have been influencing corruptly Clarence Thomas. This is how a Senate Republican reacted. Capitol complex. Go ahead, issue your subpoena next week. We'll see what happens when we take back the majority. Dude is mad at the prospect of anybody looking into the activities of the Supreme Court. And I'll say this, Dick Durbin, the chairman, the Senate Democrat chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, he's been advocating for this for like 10 years. It's nothing new. He believes that both liberal and conservative justices of the Supreme Court are obligated to adhere to binding codes of ethics, just like everybody else. Now, like Sheldon Whitehouse pointed out, this code of ethics leaves much to be desired. There's no way that doesn't describe how you file a petition. It doesn't describe who the oversight body is. It doesn't describe you know, how, what the enforcement mechanisms are or indeed what even punishments or penalties may be accrued for violations of the codes of ethics. So it's a step in the right direction. But I hope Senate Democrats do not stop, right? This is clearly a response you know, to pressure from Democrats. Clearly, the court's worried that, you know, their power might be threatened. So they're like, okay, fine, we'll take this long overdue step. But Democrats should not relent. They should say, no, 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 you're going to come the entire way. You're going to tell how we file a complaint, what enforcement mechanisms, what enforcement bodies, what penalties and punishments, just like everybody else. I hope that's the posture that Democrats take. But it's entirely, it's entirely possible, knowing that Dick Durbin, because he's kind of feckless, nice guy, but very feckless, it's entirely possible that they'll pump the brakes on this. I hope not. Let me know what you think in the comments.